a what-if scenario. Two regional powers of Southeast Asia go to war. Vietnam and Thailand had their share of conflicts in the past. In this video, despite Laos and Cambodia standing in their way, they decide to settle the matters once and for all, through military means. Which side has better weapons or better trained troops? How would geography influence the battles? And which side would fare better in such a war? Salutations! I have been told that there is an imposter out there. A whole army of them, actually. They've been made to look like me. The nerve. And I will not stand... I will not... Man, you are cute. Well, I guess I could use an adjutant. Come here, little fella, I'll take you home. And you too can take your own bink of adjutant. Available via Amazon UK. Yep, we made a bink of plushie. If you want one for yourself or as a gift, do check out our Amazon UK store. The link is available below in the video description. It's not too small, not too big, perfect for your desk or your shelf next to your military history books. Or you can give it away. We've made it as low cost as humanly possible, which is very hard when you're contracting very small production runs. Bink of Plushie costs 39 British pounds, which amounts to 42 euros or 51 US dollars. Well, go ahead and treat yourself. Vietnam hugs the western shores of the South China Sea. On the other side of the peninsula lies Thailand. In between, there are Cambodia and Laos, both of which have been subject to their bigger neighbor's whims for decades, including wars and occupation. To simplify the politics of it all, both Laos and Cambodia will be modeled as neutral, not attacking anyone unless they absolutely have to. While sea and air routes may cause some damage, without a clear land route, neither side could lose that much in a war, but there definitely could be land routes through the middle countries. The southern route through Cambodia is good in the sense there's a fairly wide corridor of more or less flat farmland, very conducive to large vehicle formations. The problem with that though is that there are also urban centers in the way. Cambodia would definitely put up a fight, and its population density means there would be a lot of Cambodians interfering there. Cambodia has a population of 15 million, and its military is fairly numerous. Their equipment is quite old though, early Soviet Cold War stuff, T-55 tanks and such. And they've got no combat air force or navy to speak of. They could basically go for a large guerrilla war push, and nothing else. That said, with so many people living there, and a considerable distance to be crossed and closely guarded from constant guerrilla attacks, going through Cambodia would present a heavy burden for either Vietnam or Thailand. It's the northern route through Laos that would possibly be preferred. The population density map shows there is less population right here, where Laos is at its narrowest. At just 60 miles across, smaller groups of soldiers could go through Laos fairly quickly. Another benefit of the Laos battlefront would be the fact there would be much less opposition. Not only is the population of Laos fairly small in general, and especially in the said area, but the military of Laos is less of a threat as well. They too count on early Cold War Soviet tech for the most part, and have no combat air force. Faced with much stronger warring sides on both left and right, there's a bigger chance Laos would simply duck and take cover, leaving the big boys to duke it out over the fairly sparsely populated area in the middle, lest it incurs their wrath. The issue with that passage through Laos, however, are the rainforest-covered mountains. There are passageways, a few half-decent roads, but to utilize the full width of the corridor, mountain and jungle troops largely devoid of vehicles and heavy weapons would have to be used by both sides. So what sort of armies does each side have, actually? Vietnam has one of the world's largest standing armies at close to half a million souls. Their army is mostly conscript based, with the draftees having to serve in the maneuver combat units. The Thai army, while also using conscripts, is less dependent on them, so their maneuver combat units are mostly populated by professional soldiers. Vietnamese conscription lasts a bit longer on the average and is less volunteer based. 
Thailand has a larger pool of active paramilitary forces, but they are mostly various police and volunteer units, while Vietnamese border force is more heavily equipped. Thailand does have some structured army reserve, unlike Vietnam, though how much they actually train, if at all, is not known. Vietnam does blow Thailand out of the water when it comes to various paramilitary reserves. Basically, we're talking about paper militia formations, which have some sort of official obligation to serve in a war. Vietnam's huge figures are remnants of their defense philosophy stemming from the occupation of Cambodia in the 1980s and their earlier wars. The geography and width of the initial front line would not allow for even a small part of such numbers though. Both sides could rush in to take up position in the Laos corridor, but venturing past Laos into the other country would be dangerous. It's exactly the supremacy in numbers in concert with extremely harsh terrain that would likely dissuade Thailand from going on an offensive. The Mekong River would be a major obstacle for Thailand initially. With only two bridges and one regular ferry line available for Thailand to take, pushing into Laos. Even though a Vietnamese push into Laos would see them face more mountains, it's likely Vietnam would be able to send in more troops in a given time, in those opening stages of the war. But would Vietnam be able to simply push through? The local numbers would likely be fairly similar, as no country would be able to cram in half a million troops in such a small area, effectively. Vehicles would get congested in those few roads through Laos. They would be very much subject to anti-tank missile ambushes, artillery barrages and airstrikes. So the Vietnamese edge in the number of army vehicles would likely not be that evident if they tried to go on an offensive. Even though Vietnam does have a lot of various tanks, they are for the most part quite old. Thailand, on the other hand, has in recent times started buying modern combat vehicles from China, though they are still low in numbers. Various light tanks, recon vehicles and IFVs continue the trend of superior numbers and much more firepower for Vietnam. APCs are more evenly numbered though. Tracked vehicles may fare a bit better in wet off-road terrain, giving Thailand a slight mobility edge. Due to low road capacities and rainforests, it's not surprising both sides have quite a few helicopters for their budgets. Which are, by the way, roughly similar when purchasing power parity is included, but in nominal terms, Thailand is somewhat ahead. Thailand has a token attack helicopter force, and Vietnam has in theory a few times more, but theirs are so old that news reports suggest those hind helicopters are not airworthy at all anymore. The bigger source of fire support for both would be artillery. The Vietnamese inventory is visibly bigger, though part of those numbers may not be in actual active service. Both sides evidently rely on towed pieces, which are harder to move around, so the lack of quickly relocatable artillery is another reason why fast-moving big offensives would be unlikely in this war. The Vietnamese have some Scud missiles, but their precision is pretty poor. Chinese sourced large caliber multiple rocket launchers that Thailand uses should offer better precision. Perhaps an even bigger source of firepower would come from the airplanes, even though neither side possesses a modern air force. Vietnam relies on a mix of ground strike Su 22s, which are Cold War relics, and almost one dozen basic flanker fighters, now a 30 plus year old design. Their perhaps most potent plane is the multi role Su 30. But aside from the added R-77 missile compatibility, those aren't really meaningfully more capable in air-to-air -air combat than the basic flankers. They too are basically early 1990s tech level planes. Unlike the Su-30 MKI lineage, they're a much more basic weapon system. They can however use a decent array of guided bombs and rockets. Just how many of such weapons Vietnam has on the other hand is unknown. Facing the Vietnamese would be the Thai air forces. But those two are a hodgepodge of Cold War era planes with a sprinkle of something more modern. The F-5s have been modernized with fairly new Israeli radars, ground targeting systems and Python air-to-air -air missiles, but they are still small point defense fighters. The F-16s are potent on paper, but roughly two-thirds of those are quite old airframes without proper modernization, unable to use AMRAAM missiles. Alpha Jet fleet is small and suitable only for light combat air support for the frontline troops, when no big opposition is present. Which leaves the not even a full dozen Gripens as the Thai most potent tool. They use AMRAMs and Irish T missiles and have good networking capability, but perhaps the strongest Thai assets would be their radars. 
a variety of European and US ground-based radars, as well as two Swedish-sourced airborne early warning systems. Thailand does have various Israeli and US-sourced targeting pods, which would enable fairly precise targeting from somewhat safe distances. Vietnam lacks such targeting systems completely, so they would have to rely on the weapon's own seekers or old built-in targeting system on Su-22s. Vietnamese air forces would be unlikely to upkeep any semblance of control of the air over the front, with the slight technological and numerical superiority of the Thai forces, coupled with greater Thai situational awareness. Thai air defense systems would aid to a small extent, but that's an area where Thailand did not invest much. They have a token force of medium-range systems, instead relying on more numerous MAMPAD class SAMs. Vietnam has a much more varied SAM network, which would make it hard for Thailand to operate over the front line, attacking ground targets as well. Let alone go deeper into Vietnam, where the Vietnamese S-300 and Israeli-sourced Spider SAMs would present quite a problem. The war in the air would thus be mostly about negating the other side's initiative to support their own ground offensive. Deep strikes to decapitate the other side's air force would be next to impossible. During all that time, a slightly less feverish series of battles would go on to the south of the big battlefield, in the seas of the Gulf of Thailand. The two navies are distinctly different in their roles. Vietnam's is fully geared towards shore defense and area denial. It has many small fast attack missile boats, but its strongest weapon is its unusually large submarine fleet. Those are fairly modern 90s tech-level subs, and they've been delivered with some long-reaching missiles. They likely include a dozen or two short-range land attack cruise missiles. Thailand has no submarines in active service yet. It does have an aircraft carrier though, but its Harrier Air Wing was retired a long time ago. So nowadays it's really a helicopter carrier. The Thai surface fleet consists of larger ships, as its visible Thai Navy's role is to patrol the seas farther away from their shores. Most of the Vietnamese boats have 90 stack Russian K-35 anti-ship missiles, while Thai ships have US-sourced harpoons and Chinese-sourced C-802s of roughly comparable level. Thai ships, being larger, also have some added value systems though, like helicopter hangars, medium-range SAM systems, and their biggest ship also has US-sourced rocket-launched anti-submarine torpedoes. Thailand's biggest problem would be the submarines by far, but also the fact that a good chunk of their fleet is based in the Indian Ocean. Reaching around to get to the Gulf of Thailand would have to be done very quickly, or else they might get ambushed by Vietnamese submarines. Then again, the northernmost Vietnamese naval bases are more geared towards China, so their vessels would need to cross a thousand miles to get to the Gulf of Thailand as well. Aerial anti-submarine fleets are roughly comparable on both sides, but given that neither side would be able to control the air in enemy territory, it means those anti-sub aircraft would be able to fly fairly freely, defending the coastlines. That's another reason why it would be hard for either side's navy to push on the offensive. Vietnam has added protection in the form of their two coastal anti-ship missile batteries, procured from Russia with potent missiles. Thailand has their most potent anti-air missile systems on some of their ships, so keeping those close to important coastal centers would also be more cost-efficient than sending those ships close to Vietnamese shores. Thailand would thus likely play defensively, Vietnam too with their surface navy, but would send in their subs to try and find an opening and sink some shipping. Operating mostly alone, those two would not likely dare going too close to Thailand. The whole naval war wouldn't be very consequential to the broader conflict. On the ground, the stalemate would initially hold. Vietnam would try to leverage their numerical superiority and attack on as broad a front as possible, even if it meant incurring more and more armed response and counterattacks from Laos. Thailand would use their slightly more modern weapons and more precise aerial fire support to try to neutralize those Vietnamese numbers. The rainforest-covered hills would also preclude Vietnam from sending in many vehicles. Thailand would suffer the same fate, but if they would be defending, they could dig in on the flatlands west of Mekong River with ample firepower. Retreating back to Thailand would also be potentially dangerous for Thai forces if Vietnam manages to cut some of those off, as those Thai units might have their backs against the Mekong River, unable to retreat. 
but in general the river would also further defend Thailand. It's a major obstacle, being on average half a kilometer wide in that area. Even if Vietnam manages to push all the way through Laos, crossing such a wide river would be next to impossible without grave casualties. If Vietnam would greatly concentrate their heavy armor to try to overmatch Thailand, they would be presenting a very target-rich environment for Thai fire support, and crossing the river over pontoon bridges would mean only a fraction of the forces could go over, greatly favoring Thailand in local numbers. It is thus unlikely Vietnam could do much on such a cramped front, offense-wise. Thailand, too, would be unable to protect its power through Laos. It would be a true stalemate. The only other option would be if Vietnam went into total war mode and tried to mobilize every man, woman and child, then rush on a much, much broader front, including going through Cambodia. Given that their population pool is double that of Thailand, and they already have their organizational structure to handle such a huge armed militia, Vietnam might indeed be able to push through Cambodian armed resistance and into Thailand proper, in some small areas. But the thing is, to fight not just Thailand, but Cambodia and most of Laos to succeed at it would incur massive casualties. By the time Vietnamese forces would reach into Thailand, they would be facing a few hundred thousand casualties just from the hands of Laos and Cambodia resistance. Overall casualties might thus easily top a million in a protracted war, while Thailand, playing defense, would likely enjoy several times smaller casualty figures. Would Vietnam be able to hold on to its gains in the long run? Unlikely. Faced with constant guerrilla attacks all over Laos and Cambodia, and with Thailand leveraging their stronger economy to buy additional Chinese arms, the tide of war would very likely eventually change. Not enough to help Thailand take anything Vietnamese, but enough to make Vietnam go back to its borders, having achieved little except for losing most of its armed forces. And if Vietnam sat back and defended from day one, with Thailand attacking, then Thailand would be the one losing much more of its forces. Without any side attacking, the whole war would be a true stalemate. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.